cosmic trigger probably on the influence of some psychedelic drugs but we'll come to that and in it he summarizes yours and your brother's work on the time wave and he in fact charts out history into three major sections the 67 year section which will comprise the bulk of my life an interesting 13 month section which will happen in 2011 and then an interesting six day section which will happen uh, immediately preceding the winter solstice in 2012 uh, in which I believe during the last six day session there will be more novelty than has existed on the planet since ever. Since ever. And I looked at this and I had been reading, I'd started off easy, so I'd read Alvin Toffler, and then I could take a little bit more, so I worked myself up into Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, and then I came across that and I said, well, this appears to be the case. It was confirmed to me internally in a way that I could not particularly argue with, I could not argue out of. It was simply a foundational fact. And all of my work thereafter was based on a premise that the universe is seeking a type of closure, that in fact things are converging. And so my own life study had been perhaps an exploration of what those avenues of convergence were. And it ended up over a period of years that my own life story became a search to create the forms of that convergence. So we'll now flash forward to my first experience of virtual reality, which happened in 1990 and required absolutely no technology except about 500 micrograms of LSD-25. <laughs> I've been thinking, I've been reading, and all of a sudden I drop acid after several years. And of course, if you've taken several years break and all of a sudden flush yourself back into that realm, you can find that things really pop up. And I found myself in a virtual world. And what I found in this virtual world, the thing that I, I must have suspected that I would find in this virtual world, wasn't an artificial Tron-like environment. It wasn't something that was entirely artificial. What I beheld in that environment was an image of the planet, as if I was cruising above it in a spaceship. And I knew that part of my own destiny as connected with virtual reality wasn't to escape into another dimension, but to find a way to make real to us the things that we can't always see, because we exist at a level of scale, of experience that hides them from us. And at that point in my life, I decided I needed to leave New England and come to California, where everything was really going on. This was 1990, and VR was the hot new thing. And we forget now that VR was the hot new thing before the internet became the hot new thing, but for a while, it was the cheese. <laughs> and I moved to San Francisco, which made it much easier to get good drugs. <laughs> and I started to explore by working, by building systems, what virtual reality was. And this started to have a profound change on my own understanding of how reality was constructed because my psychedelic description of reality, which is that mind forms reality, began to conflate or become identical with my physical or scientific description of reality, which is that mind forms reality. And all of a sudden I understood that everything I used to understand about the way the universe works wasn't as true as I had thought. And so this began to inspire in me a search, a search to get to some basic level of being that would allow me to work in a world that was manifest because of my own will. And just as much as manifest because of your own will. Because where we're going, the simulated and the real are going to get really blurry. And we don't have any tools. We don't have any tools of mind. Western culture, which is based on this idea of this objective external reality, it's not hard. It's all become very soft and it's all flowing together. So we need to now start to find ways of describing what's going on. And so what we need to do, I found in my own investigations, is to take a look at cultures that describe the world magically, that understand that perception shapes what you are and you shape what you see, and that they're, they're not separate areas, they're not separate domains, but you have to consider them as a whole. So the, the four sort of prongs that got talked about in the uh, blurb that was written for this piece are 
techno-paganism, and techno-paganism is maybe, you, you could describe it a bunch of different ways, and I certainly didn't make the word up, and I certainly didn't apply the word to myself, but it stuck because Wired Magazine published an article two years ago with my face blazoned on it, Photoshop reversed in color, and said, this is a techno-pagan. And really what it was trying to do was trying to articulate my own experience of being thrust into this world where everything was melting and nothing was solid and trying to come to grips with it philosophically, trying to come to grips with it ontologically. And my own explorations had led me to understand that in fact in a world where anything you want is true, the only way you can deal with this is by learning how to deal with your will. Dealing with your will is what magic has always, in all cultures, always been about. This is why the shaman doesn't go insane when the world just disappears. He's ready for it. They're ready because they understand that where they are isn't bound up in their view of the world. The internet is a connective layer. And you were talking about this last night. It's beautiful. If you took a picture of this room in 1990 and you took a picture of it today, Everything will look, look exactly the same, and yet everything is completely different. Because in 1990, we didn't have this layer of bits that's flowing seamlessly among all of us. Mm -hmm. And it's changed us. It's radically sped up the way we deal with information in society. And every bit of information that passes through you changes you. Mm -hmm. You cannot be unaffected in any way by any bit of information. So the internet is acting as this enormous accelerator. It's acting as something that's passing through all of us and radically transforming us. And part of what it's doing is ripping us apart. And that's dangerous. If we don't approach that carefully, and if we don't approach that with a lot of heart, we're going to find ourselves and what we think of as ourselves ripped away in that process. One of the reasons why I think it's very important that this is happening at Esalen is because if Esalen were running a political campaign, their slogan would be, it's the body, stupid. <laughs> because it begins here and it ends here. And if we can stay in our bodies, even while we're projected into cyberspace, we have some zone for sanity. We have some zone for being. And psychedelics can produce these boundary dissolutions where you flow into another thing. Well, we're going to see, and it's actually quite true, that certain types of VR can produce precisely the same affect. There are zones where virtual reality can be very dangerous for that reason or incredibly powerful and meaningful for that reason. So where I, I would like to work from this weekend is I really want to work from the heart. I personally think in my own philosophy that to work in technology you have to work from the heart center because otherwise you'll create golems, you'll create Frankensteins, your creations will run away from you and this is, that's the essence of the story of the golem is that this is a creature that was created with the breath of life but without the light of knowledge or the heart, the heart of God. So we really have to work from that and one of the things that we'll be doing this weekend for that and we're inviting you, I don't think we're requiring you because that would just not be in the tenor of this place, but we're inviting you at 7.30 in the morning, both tomorrow and Sunday, to come practice Kundalini Yoga. And Kundalini Yoga works very much on the heart center. It's not strenuous. I guarantee it will be fun. Uh, we have a very good teacher, James, who will be teaching this. And the idea is that with these exercises, we can help to open up our heart centers so that when we talk tomorrow, when we meet tomorrow, we can really be working from that, even when we're talking about these ideas that may be very technologically relevant, they won't be isolated in our minds. That all said, <laughs> I also want to explore the joyous nature of what we can do. And a lot of my work has been around exploring the joyous nature of what we can do. We have to, if, we, if we're working from our hearts in these environments, then a part of what we want to do is be joyous in these environments. One of my biggest gripes about the internet is that it can't, as yet, contain the tenor of human emotion, which is so important. If we're building this edifice to be the global mind and it can't laugh, we've got a big problem. If it can't sing, we have a big problem. And so one of the things we'll be doing 
probably in the evening on Saturday, is doing something we call voce, which Paul and I have been working on. We call it world song or voce, which is a singing or toning technique. And it can produce a quality of connection in a group of people, which is the closest I've, I've heard it described is it's almost like instant ecstasy. In, in the sense of the drug, and it's, it's, it's a temporary sort of lowering of the interpersonal barriers in, in a really, really wonderful way. And hopefully at the end of all of this, uh, I will have been inspired, and Terence will have been inspired by what you had to say, and will be able to bring that, that heart-centeredness, which has to, I believe, remain at the heart of how we work when we're working in the world and with technology in the world. Mm. <laughs> Isn't he a great guy? <laughs> if I had the Timothy Leary laurels with me, I'd hand them all. <laughs> <laughs> the bad penny could pass. <laughs> well, that's... Uh, it's, I love listening to Mark rap this stuff and he really knows where he's coming from and uh, it's it's exciting stuff I've been into this psychedelic thing since the late 60s and it's transformed in different ways and there's been a strange sort of literary parallelism or cloud over my own life so that as my obsessions evolve society obligingly evolved in the same direction and when I got started with psychedelics it was because I was uh, interested in the mystical experience a la uh, Yaka Burma and Thomas Traherne and all that sort of thing and I had read Aldous Huxley's book The Doors of Perception so it was a spiritual intentionality and uh, as time passed I, I was completely satisfied in that but I also became interested then in what were psychedelics in terms of their impacts on large numbers of people and on human social and cultural evolution because to me it was just this incredible power this dimension which my own culture completely denied and overlooked but that obviously from the first time I had a major trip on it was clear to me that this had to have evolutionary implications and it seemed to me as I read my Darwin and uh, and uh, Freud that there had to be some kind of quickening influence in human emergence that if not outright transcendental was certainly unique and out of the ordinary order of nature and so then I spent years thinking about psychedelics implications for human evolution and most of you if you're interested know my theories about all this well then the engagement with it extended further and I began to see it as uh, a lens for coordinating large amounts of data in order to essentially prophesize the future that the the future somehow I had the notion that history and the individual life built around the psychedelic experience were fractal reflections of each other and that led to the conclusion that history is a trip and that led to the conclusion that the yes the the best was yet to come or the yes was bet to come I'm not sure uh, so it had this socio-political and historical implication and uh, it wasn't as simple as just imagining what would happen if societies would permit these things but I could also see that it was a catalyst on imagination that uh, you know whatever it was that psychedelics were doing it was taking anybody's notion of reality anybody's mindset and radically extending it 
and if they found that comfortable they were ecstatic and if they found it horrifying they were traumatized but the common thread was takes ordinary minds makes them bigger stranger more grotesque less predictable more bizarre uh, so then that was not yet the outer parameter of the issues that this phenomenon, the psychedelic experience, seemed to engage. It seemed to me that at the personal and experiential level, the thing that was so astonishing about it was not that it led, at least for me, directly to God. What it led to was more art than I conceived of existing. How was it that, you know, in a five-hour psilocybin trip, an ordinary person lying in darkness sees more art than is stored and cataloged in all the museums of Europe? I mean, this was confounding to me. And I had a Jungian bias, too, so I was full of the notion of the commonality of the unconscious and all that. And so I was puzzled, why don't I see these motifs? in Tibetan painting, Shipibo carving, uh, what, why, how can something which is so near you know, over a very slight energy threshold involved in taking these substances be so distant from our cultural values and our store of images? And it was around this time, roughly 1990, that I began to hear the first buzz about virtual reality. And I knew, the minute I understood the concept, I knew, in the same way that I knew when I heard about the first Mac and LSD and uh, uh, potassium sugar perchlorate uh, rocket fuels, that this was going to be the next great thing. And uh, as a tool of art, as a tool for leading us beyond the notion that we are a, a, a hive society of advanced primates because that's how we visually appear to the empirical point of view uh, that's, a, that's an out of context description of what we are it's like a schematic or an aerial map what we really are is the community of mind knitted together by codes and symbols, intuitions, aspirations, histories, hopes, the, the invisible world of the human experience is far more real to us than the visible world, which is little more than uh, a kind of screen or stage upon which uh, we move. So this thing Mark said, I, I heard it for the first time and, and got it, that the purpose of VR is to show us aspects of reality that are not artificial but that are fields of data not ordinarily coordinated by ordinary perception. You know, Ralph Abraham, who's a favorite around here, has talked about how mathematics, which has been a high priesthood of arcane formulae and special signifying languages, is giving way to visual understanding. Uh, if you talk to someone about a seven or eight dimensional process, most people completely blur out. If you show them an animation of an ongoing eight dimensional process, everybody understands without a word being said exactly uh, what is happening. So I see virtual reality as a way uh, not of escaping the, any notion of empirical reality, but as a way of reportraying invisible levels of the given world that are very vital 
and important to us how we see flows of energy how we understand complex economies how we understand the fractal uh, hierarchies of nature everything is about to get very much more complicated much larger the number of choices are about to exponentially explode in a sense these technologies point us toward if not literal godhood then a kind of fictional godhood we are all going to become the masters of the narrative in which we are embedded our separate stories are going to take on dimensions so uh, multiferous that for all practical purposes we will each move into a cosmos of our own creation and control it's in a way all that is happening is that what is already co-present with three-dimensional reality is being literalized but literalized in in uh, time scales that make the nature of the game apparent to all but the dullest among us. I mean, after all, we have always lived in virtual realities ever since we abandoned nomadism and defined uh, a polis and a wilderness. And, uh, you know, when Hammurabi set up the first uh, codes in Babylon these were operating codes these were constraints on the human system that did not fully implement its capabilities but rather defined and limited it for purposes of implementing uh, certain design goals well now we've been in the birth canal of the design process for about 8,000 years now and uh, and we can see light at the end of the tunnel the French have a notion of uh, uh, forward escape that means when the situation gets so crazy then you just hit the accelerator and drive straight up the middle and that's the forward escape and technology represents this for us. Our ideologies are probably lethal, obviously lethal, I would say, but they are fortunately a kind of chrysalis of ideological constraint that technology is in the process of dissolving. And, you know, uh, William Butler saw this in the 19th century, Teilhard de Chardin reached it in the 40s and the 50s, McLuhan expressly articulated this vision in the 50s and the 60s. This is really, you know, as Ahab tells the crew in Moby Dick, this is what you've shipped for, mate. Uh, th this, this was the plan, you know, Plato said if God does not exist, man and will create such a thing and we are creating a simulacrum of our highest hopes and the effort to define the actual delimiting architecture of our hope is an intellectual exercise that we have never previously submitted to and what I mean by that is when you can do anything what do you do? Uh, we've always worked within the constraints of mortar, glass, steel, our, our economic scales, our, the physical scales. VR eliminates all of this. You know, the difference between a 10-story building and a 100-story building in virtual reality is one zero in a line of code. Well, with that kind of freedom, the human imagination, which has been defined by limitation, the planet's surface, uh, the needs and wishes of others, is going to unfold in these super spaces. And, uh, you know, it's a Gnostic epiphany. If you believe, it, what it really comes down to in terms of the politics and psychology of it is a final resolution, in, to my mind, of the question, is man good? Uh, in other words, with all constraints removed, do we descend into a, 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 a world of, uh, you know, Freudian nightmare and simulated uh, sadomasochism or do we 
express something which matter always mitigated against. So that's what I think is... I'm sure we will do both. I mean, the essence of choice means uh, uh, not only will, will we collectively do both, probably each and every one of us will do both, you know? Occasionally you flop on the seamy side. It gives a literary quality to life that's lacking among the tight ass. <laughs> so... Um, <laughs> Well, I don't know. It's a quarter of ten. Do you want to riff off that for a bit? And then we'll send these folks packing. I've been um, piecing together an essay while I've been here, which I'm calling West of Esalen, <laughs> which is interesting because if you take a look at what's West of Esalen, you see a gaping cliff, which has been growing of late. And Esalen, as is all of California, is breaking off and falling into the sea. And there is no safe land anywhere. And that's more than a metaphor for where we are now. And it's interesting because there's talk about what Esalen has to do with the modern age. And yet so much of what we think of as modern language has been shaped by what's come out of this place talking about, you know, somebody's vibes or being touchy-feely or even doing yoga, which is now, of course, all the rage in late millennial culture. These are all impulses that came out of this place. So there's something about this space and about the body which is incredibly right. And even if Esalen vanished tomorrow, God, God is forbid, even if it did, the impact of it as an institution has been profound. And I think perhaps what we're trying to do here this weekend and tonight is to extend the franchise of Esalen into another realm, to say that the values that make us human, and the values that make us good, mm. are the values that come out of what's done here, and maybe the values that rely on the body in some way. That even as we talk about this Gnostic release, this uploading of the soul into some sort of silicon which we will talk about that there's this body that's behind sort of bitching saying excuse me I'm real and I am the potential I am the ground in which you work because of that I, I hope that we will spend some of the weekend not just speculating but constantly looping and bringing it back into the body and where the body is. The question of the body is one of the largest questions in virtual reality. That's a curious contradiction and yet it's true. Where is the body in cyberspace? Where are you when your email is flashing across the net, when your agents are doing your bidding? Where are you? And how do you maintain yourself? And it was interesting because there was a comment that was made earlier about psychedelics as a shortcut versus yoga or one of the other traditions. And I know that in my own life, I need both of them because I need the psychedelics in order to be able to have the vision, but I need the yoga in order to maintain the stability to express the vision. And so there's both dials there. It's as if, if the internet is some sort of collective psychedelic, we're going to need the body as we pass through it so that we can explore the zones within ourselves that are the good. Yeah, it's great what you say about that we're trying to push the definitions of Esalen's relevance because, you know, the entire intellectual and spiritual effort here over the past 30 years flies under the flag of the human potential movement. I mean, that's what it's called. And certainly what we're talking about here and trying to bring gently onto the stage is, is an enormous frontier of human potential. Uh, we are to some degree beginning to design ourselves or beginning to design our potential in the service of the idea of a perfected uh, humanity 
of some sort. And what we're talking about here is not genetic manipulation or eugenics or any of these somewhat dubious uh, enterprises with a clouded history, but using uh, technological prosthesis to extend and enrich humanness to enrich communication and it is believe me the want of good communication that is the thing probably if anything undoes us this will be it that our languages failed that we misread each other's intent that we could not understand each other so the the project of refining language uh, is uh, is the same project as the ending of history. I mean, history is the story of languages that failed. And when language grows perfect, history will end. And it may, language may not look like it looks today or sound like it sounds today. The realization that's flowered in the wake of the internet and the rise of cybernetics is that everything is made of information information is the primary datum of being concepts like time and space and energy are orders of magnitude removed from uh, the present at hand when compared with a concept like information and and as mark said every iota every bit of information that passes through us that we generate that we transmit uh changes us so I'm seeing here almost a theosophical epiphany of language trying to bootstrap itself toward realms of platonic perfection, which as organic beings we experience as love. Love, beauty, truth, these are the vectors of human becoming. They always have been, they always will be. And the technologies that open these paths for us are uh, no more and no less uh, powerful than uh, the human beings that wield them. So, uh, you know, this is, uh, this is an enterprise of integrity and millennial implication. And what lies as the goal is true humanness in sympathetic symbiosis with the planet and with these strange children that we have brought into the world, our machines. I mean, that is the challenge at the end of history. And that's what we'll be talking about this weekend. Thanks for coming and to uh, get some sleep. Uh, Mark, I wanted to ask you, where is the okay. yoga? Is yoga it here? is 7 th no, 7.30 tomorrow morning. It is that they have movements here. In the big room, uh, in the meeting room in the big house. In the big house, the living room at 7.30. Everyone familiar where the yeah. big house is? It's across the bridge and it's the big house. Okay. It's the big house. <laughs> okay. it's, it's opposed to the little house, which it sits uh, opposite from. And it's the big house, 7.30, please. You, you'll enjoy it. If you have a blanket or something, bring it. It'll be comfy, but if not, don't worry about it.